Uh, my name is Rivko Dimitrov. For those of you who uh, missed uh, my talk earlier today, um, I uh, work throughout UX, so from research on to interaction design and um, uh, visual and front-end as well. Um, I've historically worked in uh, finance here in London, um, so a lot of investment banking and trading applications, and now I'm uh, focusing on um, reinsurance. So today we're going to focus on card sorting. Um, I don't know how many of you have done card sorting in the past. Can I see raise? Okay, that's healthy. Great. Okay, so let's make this a discussion. Feel free to jump in and uh, ask questions or provide insight as I'm speaking. Um, for the others, it's fairly practical. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll cover the um, why you should do it. Um, if you haven't done it, I'll give some uh, word of advice. What um, card sorting is, and then most importantly, how to do it. At the end of it, hopefully, we'll do uh, an interactive uh, session. So, I have prepared a small um, a cards, uh, card sorting study, or rather, we will prepare together a small card sorting study. We'll fill it in and then we'll analyze it so you can all see how quick it can be done. Um, for that to work, I was hoping that each of you has a QR reader application on their phone. Um, so maybe take the, um, if you have a phone, um, take the time for the lecture. If you don't have a QR reader app, try and install one. I'll, I'll send a, a QR code later on and you can all use that to access the study. All right, so card sorting, why do you use that? So um, in my current job, um, I, when I joined, um, they showed me this screen and they said, okay, well, Thanks for coming in because we've been working on this UI and we need your help. <laughs> and so um, it's a UI for underwriting reinsurance deals. And I think by now it's very safe to, to take those seats. Um, and a reinsurance deal is a rather complicated thing. Um, it has around at least, I would say 100 to 150 properties. And it's things like, I don't think you can read this, but it has things like inuring, uh, ex ex adjustable, uh, adjustable index, subject uh, currency. So things that I was reading like, I have no idea what they mean. And I was being asked to uh, group these meaningfully and intuitively for users. And so I was like, well, I have no idea how to do this. I don't even know what they mean. So how do you do this as a challenge? How do you take uh, a taxonomy, taxonomy of uh, 100 to 150 or even more properties, which you sometimes will not even know what they mean, and how do you order it in a way that makes sense for users, and you don't even know those users as well? So the obvious thing here is card sorting. Um, that's the, um, that's the a method that will give you access, direct access to the mental model of users. So um, it allows you to form an information architecture on the back of how users think of that information structure rather than on the back of your own conception of it. Um, and on beyond just the information architecture, I find it's very useful in mapping the client experience. Once people describe the whole space of the data they work with, they obviously always touch on the workflow that goes through that information structure as well. So this, is, this has been very useful for my user journeys as well. So uh, if I don't know how many of you share that same uh, misconception I had about card sorting uh, in my past life before I started doing it. I just had a chat with Bride, my colleague here, um, and she said she hasn't really done it extensively. Um, and I thought it's a bit of a gimmicky thing in the past. I've always been like, oh, it's too fancy with like post-it notes and just trying to be, uh, to look like a designer rather than getting out uh, something out of it. Um, it's not, it's genuinely helpful. It's very quick to do and it's incredibly uh, strong insight. So um, if you have that misconception, forget about it, it's really good. So from the bottom of my heart, it's, 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 it works. Um, <coughs> so how, um, okay, well first on the what side, what is card sorting? You've all seen these. Um, well, it looks terrible on this screen, but it's post-it notes. Um, each of them has a, a category or a piece of information on it. And uh, I've asked users to group them. 
so they would just stack them together. And on the back of these groups, I will form some opinion on how they think of the information. So um, that's kind of the, the gist of it. It's pretty simple. It can be done offline. Um, so you kind of stick physical artifacts on a, on a wall. Um, or it can be done online. So you have a digital uh, representation of cards and then you group them online. There's different advantages to each of those. Um, when you do it offline, um, I think you get a lot more information and you get a lot more of a considered response from your users. Um, when w you, I think, all, all have heard the amount of, what was it, more than half of the information during a conversation is transmitted uh, through nonverbal signs. And it's the same here. Um, when, you, when you are in the room with the user, when, when they do the ordering, you get so much more from the cues and the context. So like, is there a, a hesitation when they're grouping this? Um, are they unhappy about this choice? Are they not sure about something? All of those things can be lost online because you just don't see those, uh, those cues. So potentially, for me, offline is always the, the better option. The drawback of that is that uh, it, you need to be there, physically present. Sometimes your users will not be, or they will be geographically distributed, so it's not practical. Um, and also online is just quicker, which is a drawback because it means it's less considered. People will just tend to pay more attention when you're in the room, and they will put more thought into the process. Uh, but that will also take a bit more time for them. So. Always my recommendation is offline, but if you're not there, if there's geographic limitations, online works pretty well as well. Um, other types of card sorting, closed or open. So if you know your taxonomy, if you know the products and the categories or whatever piece of information you're designing around, you just put those on cards. But what you can do is as well start with just a blank piece of paper or lots of blank post-it notes and ask your users to uh, write their own categories on it. So um, if you have a very open um, project in the beginning of, of the research phase when you don't even know what users want, um, let alone how they categorize those ones, then you can be uh, very open about that and ask users to say, what, is the, what are the pieces of information you would like to uh, see in my application? So uh, that's very explorative. Um, and uh, it's kind of, it's very helpful when you don't know your information structure. If you know your information structure, um, you use the closed ones, it's quite guiding, so it will tell you how that information structure uh, is perceived by users, but it will not tell you if that's the right information structure. Maybe you're looking at the wrong things, so do consider. Um, other types of studies, um, individual or group, you can do this one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So you, you sit with one user and then you get their opinion. Or you can do it as a group, which becomes more of like a focus group kind of thing, where you ask the group to consult and to aggregate a single opinion of what the grouping should be. So um, obviously, um, the individual uh, outcomes are a lot more diverse. Um, and what you do is like, it's kind of like this funnel. So you get a lot of opinions and then you use statistical analysis to aggregate those and to decide what, where the patterns are. Uh, whereas the group is kind of um, reverse. So you, 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 you probably have just a few group sessions. So out of those, you will have just a few groupings. But the discussions that go around the selection of those groupings will give you a lot of insights on how users approach the problem, how users think through the information structure. So it really is more the, the process here that matters, and it reveals a lot. So um, you have very different means to, um, to analyze both. Both are very valid. It depends on whether you want to build consensus within a group sometimes, or whether you, want, whether you have a very consistent user group um, or different target audiences within it. But both have valid ways to do it. Uh, and I think the most important um, cat, uh, cat kind of type of um, card sorting is as well moderated versus unmoderated. So it's whether you are there physically present uh, or not even physically, but I've done it remotely as well. But in my remote presence, uh, someone does it online versus you just send the link and people just 
get on with it on their own. Um, there are no reasons to choose a moderated for the quality. Um, moderated is always better because most of the insight you get from the discussion that goes through the exercise, not just from the outcome. The unmoderated I would recommend if you have huge audiences, so you have like hundreds or thousands of people and obviously you don't want to invest your time in, in uh, doing the um, individual studies. So they're very easy, um, it's scalable. And because you distribute it to so many people, the results might be quite valid because of just the scale of it. Uh, but what's uh, ideal for me is to combine the two. So if you have loads of, uh, of users, then do a handful of, unmo of moderated studies and then send out um, unmoderated links to all the others. So that's kind of the uh, gist of all the types of card sorting exercises. Any questions to here or any feedback? Anything? Okay, so now we're going to try and figure out how you do one. Okay, so this is the, the kind of important elements you need to consider if you're going to be doing card sorting. First, you have to choose where you're going to do it, so the space. Um, then set up the time, so meetings or how, when you're going to do those. How you're going to record the uh, outcomes. And then do you need to provide incentives for your users. Let's focus on each of those. So the space, um, there's, there's a few options. Uh, my preference is to do this contextually, so at the actual workstation of a user. Uh, now, there's a, an assumption here that the user has like a desk. That's kind of the projects I've mostly been involved with. But if you're doing a uh, very physical, like a, a, a physical shop, maybe you do it in a shop. Um, rationale here is that you will uh, have access to all the artifacts. So if users are discussing why they group these two functionalities together, they can show you on their screen because they appear here on this, on this current monitor or like if you're in a shop, they can, you can go in the shop and you can see why, how they're related. So that gives you a lot of opportunity to start conversations and to see the, um, uh, the artifacts that users, um, uh, users employ to link concepts together. Um, <coughs> another strategy is to just um, use a space close to the work area, but not exactly at the workstation. I've had great success with setting up um, uh, physical card sorting in like the kitchen area of, uh, of a team. And it's very nice because, like I said, it is gimmicky a little bit, so it's fancy, like you put cards everywhere and people get drawn to that. So. Um, <coughs> Once you're there, even if you have like four or five participants initially, people will just pass by and say, oh, what are you doing? Uh, can I do it as well? So I've had like uh, free recruitment in that way, very successful. Um, and it also brings out the word. So you kind of start uh, marketing your project to the audience, which is always a good thing. So that's one other strategy you can do for your space. And the most common probably is uh, the meeting room. So um, you just get a, a dedicated space and you book a meeting room for that study. Uh, <coughs> a few tips here. It's quite nice if you, if you have a glass wall um, at your disposal. What I tend to do is um, write the term or the, the, the category on one side of the post-it note and then I will label with uh, numbers the other side of the note. So one, two, three, four, five. So then when the users are done grouping them, I will take a picture not just from the front but from the back as well. Um, and that helps a lot when you are uh, inputting the data later on. If you're trying to put all of those results in Excel, it's much easier to just type in one, two, five, six, rather than typing in all the categories. So a glass wall can save a lot of effort there. But again, um, it's just uh, an efficiency gain. Um, the other thing you have to remember is to randomize your cards. That's something you get for free online. But uh, when you're doing it offline, um, and you have your sessions stacked one after the other. It's very tempting to just peel off the cards and leave them for the next user. And they're ordered already in a very intuitive way for them likely. So that, that might bias them. So remember to always randomize the cards to make sure that the next user doesn't get influenced by the previous. Right, time. It's very quick. It normally takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you don't really do it with a lot of terms. I, I wouldn't recommend you do it with more than 20 or 30 cards. 
uh, anything more than that gets challenging um, for the users. Um, so with all the explanations and all the, um, the um, um, background, it normally takes me 15, 20 minutes. Online, it takes about five to 10, I would think. Um, and what I tend to do is combine it with an interview or a different research um, initiative. Um, just because it's, it's too much overhead for 15 minutes to schedule a meeting with someone, I would schedule a full hour for a, an interview and a card sorting exercise. So uh, the first 45 minutes you would go through a regular interview and then at the end you're like, oh, let's do something nice and fun and, and uh, exciting to wake up. And uh, that could be a card sorting exercise. It's a nice way to wrap up your uh, meeting with the user. Recording. Um, you will find out that it's a very physical process if you're doing this um, uh, with, with, well, uh, offline. Um, so the user will be pointing to things, you will be pointing to things, so your hands will be busy and you won't be able to take notes. So uh, definitely try and record um, your audio and then transcribe it afterwards. What I try and do is take notes during the um, session. So if I have an insight, I will scribble down just uh, a couple of words for me to remember that insight and to come back to it later. Um, so certainly have a pen and pencil, but don't, don't think that you'll be able to record the actual conversation. And then definitely don't, uh, it's a no-brainer, but don't uh, forget to take the pictures after that because uh, once, once they're gone, they're gone and you've lost the study. So definitely take a, sna a snapshot um, of the um, uh, groupings from each user. Um, and then also try and, like, I've, I've had this as a practical tip. Uh, if I have like five or six a day, um, then uh, try and figure out the way to differentiate which user uh, had which picture. So either write up the name or in some way mark it. Um, otherwise, it's quite easy to have like six or seven random pictures and you can't remember uh, which one was from which user. You have to use the, transcrib the transcripts to try and reconstruct and it becomes a bit of a mess. Um, and it's important to know which one, which user did um, which because the context might be different, um, the explanations might, um, might be different. So. Uh, that's words of advice for the recording part. And then incentives. I have to say I've never used incentives. Uh, I have the uh, luxury to work mostly with internal users, so they will just do as they're told by their manager and uh, s spend an hour with me. Um, but if you're doing um, external, um, external users, then obviously you need to provide an incentive for them. Make sure that that incentive doesn't bias them. Make sure that uh, they don't feel obliged to uh, group things in a certain uh, positive for you order. So try and, uh, try and uh, keep the objectivity there. Okay, so um, that's kind of the preparation bit. And then once you've done it, um, what, what you have to do is really analyze the data, which is what we'll do now. Um, what you do is first input the data. So if it's online, it's very easy. It's already in a digital format. If it's offline, I normally use Excel, which can be painstaking. And that's where the numbering helps a lot if you have the one, two, three. Um, also because the statistical analysis normally works with, with numbers anyway. So um, then you do the statistical analysis. I, um, years ago, um, I used to do manually, so SPSS and other systems that would do the uh, correlation analysis. But now there's really good tools. I'll, um, I'll show you the one that I use right now, which automate everything, make it a lot more simpler and uh, something that any designer uh, can, can um, rationalize. And I'll, sh I'll show you the an analysis now. You do a qualitative analysis and uh, a statistical analysis. So the statistical brings out some of the patterns and the qualitative is your just interpretation from the conversations or the, the background information you got from your meetings. And then you join those two together to decide on the most appropriate information architecture for your structure. So how does that work? Um, let's do one study um, in here. And... Uh, Hopefully, you will see the analysis in action when we analyze it. it uh, it's an experiment for me. Um, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, but I hope that this one will, will work. So I'm going to share my screen now. 
and I was hoping that we as a group define a study. Um, so what I do is I use this optimal workshop uh, software. It's kind of the, the standard software uh, for um, card sorting. Um, it, it works really well. Um, there are a few um, other alternatives out there for the analysis, but for the actual carrying out, I think this works great. Um, it's fairly simple, so you have cards here. And what I was hoping to do today is uh, a study to figure out how we group the different um, possible topics in the UX conference. So we are designers, we're a good target audience. Let's come up with what we want to hear in the UX conference. We'll put it on cards and then each of you will try online and fill in a card sorting exercise and then we'll see whether the results bring out some patterns and how we group those, those uh, topics together. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so uh, volunteers to uh, suggest cards. What, what would you guys want to hear in a UX conference? Case studies. Okay. Yeah. Anything Process, else? Processes. Processes. Yeah. Methodology. Yeah. Tools. Tools. Okay. Management. Sorry. Management. Management. Yeah. Training. Training. Okay. Insights. Okay. Sponsorship. Sorry? Sponsorship. Sponsorship. Okay. Best practices. Best practices. Let's see how many we have. We have 13. We should probably aim for like 20, so yeah, let's do a few more. Future, Future yeah. Career okay. Qualifications. Qualifications. Different areas of UX, so design, research. Okay, so let's say design research. What, what other areas were you thinking? Like yeah. Of UX. UX design, shall we say interaction design? Sure. Further Use reading. Sorry? Further reading. Further reading. Okay, we have 20, so let's say that's that's a good one. So you see how simple it is? You put in the um, the the cards here and then I'm going to launch this. Okay. And now there should be a link to, um, okay, it should be working. So that's where the QR thing comes in. And I'll ask you to um, try, you have like five minutes. I apologize, the software is not optimized for phones. I think they've correctly thought that no one would use it on the phone, so it's not a good experience. Um, but uh, it still works. Um, if you struggle with it, you will kind of get it. I'm going to do it myself as well, actually, while we're at it. If someone doesn't have a phone, they could come and do it on my computer, and that might be helpful for others to see how, how it works on the computer as well if we have a volunteer. Oops. Do you know which browser it works best in? I th I've used it in um, <coughs> Chrome and then in the portrait mode as well. So in Chrome it works reasonably well. But the screen is not optimized, so apologies for it. Um, to their credit, you would never do it on, on, on a phone in a real life situation. 
Um, so I, I would still recommend the tool as a, as a, good, as a good resource. Does anyone want to uh, do it on, on the computer? Yeah, do you want to? It would be helpful for all the others to see um, if you sit in here. So one thing I would say, the application asks you to name the categories. Don't bother, I think, for, for the purposes of this, it's going to take too much time. So No, that's something you would actually often get from a user as well. Um, <laughs> you can't do it on this one, but I would normally take a note and because um, yeah. it's a valid thing to do. Um, so yeah, and sometimes I think you can leave the opportunity for them to add a second card here. So. Yeah? yeah, so maybe just click finished. Uh, I didn't name that. But That's fine, we don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, you do need to. Um, it says you need to name the groups. Really? <coughs> in order to finish it. I didn't. Oh, uh, sorry about this. It allowed me, maybe because I'm logged in. Oh, yeah. Apologies. Well, 
if you couldn't be bothered, maybe just put in any any names. Yeah. Great. And I'm gonna <laughs> see how that. Let's see. Hey. <laughs> the, the running in. It's all right. It's all right. The analysis is really powerful. Huh? It is. I tend to do this now, even when I'm offline. Like I'll just go to the computer and do this because then you don't have to code it and yeah. So I yeah. Even when I do the post-it notes, mm -hmm. I will then come in and use this to enter the <laughs> because I it's so. because they do the analysis. So. Okay, so I'm using a um, free trial here, um, so. It only give, allows me to have just 10 uh, answers, and we already have 10 answers. Um, so I'm going to probably pause where you are. Um, and uh, apologies to all that uh, will not be considered in this analysis. Um, but uh, the goal of this really was more to uh, for you to experience the process and to see how easy it is. Um, it really is easy with this software. Uh, I'm not being paid or advertising this, but uh, it is it is a good a good solution, and I tend to use it even when I do offline um, offline studies. I will then code them in here because of the power of their analysis. So once you have the results here, you will see for each of the um, of the results, kind of maybe I'll include the ones that are not like uh, fully fully done um, I will kind of include those as well uh, and okay I'm not gonna include this one okay and so after this what you start looking at is the um, categories. The bit that I find very useful is the standardization, standardizing, no, the similarity matrix. Okay, and this is probably a good one. I think we, we will have a more or less valid results here. So what this visualization shows you is a heat map of how mm, related um, each of these categories are. So the number here displays how many times new trends and future were grouped in the same category. So basically everyone grouped, 100% of the participants grouped, put new trends and future in the same category. Um, and literally no one put new trends and UX design in the same category. Mm -hmm. That's uh, so, some harsh <laughs> statement. Um, but um, what you have essentially is a heat map of what are the related terms. What you're looking at when you, when you have this is for triangles. So I'm looking for things like this. Do you see this nice triangle here? And what it tells me is that all of these here are related because they have a strong color between them. So it means that literally there's a strong relation between all of these ones. 
So that's kind of what I'm looking at when I'm when I'm analyzing it. It's it's quite simple, but it really is just triangles. Um, that means that they are they are related between themselves. So in this here, I would say there's a very clear relation between these three. So new trends, future, and virtual reality. That's not a surprise, is it? That does kind of make sense. Um, and then over here, we have virtual reality UX, well, more like this triangle here. So UX design, interaction design, user research, design research, card sorting, and maybe even tools. So kind of this tells us these are related as well. And when you think about it, it does make sense, right? These are all the types of, um, well, the different areas of UX design and card sorting is an example of, of one of them. So this kind of makes sense as well. Then another research, uh, another, another kind of triangle you can form is here. So you can see kind of insight processes, best practices, methodologies, um, and tools, so maybe we, we get this one. So to me, again, kind of makes sense. Tools, methodologies, it's synonyms, best practices, processes. Um, so those are all kind of similar notions. Um, and then further reading, case studies, insights. So again, this is a, a separate one, makes sense. And then these ones, very strongly related as well sponsorship, management, qualifications, career opportunity, training. I think it makes sense as well. So you see how really from just a very quick uh, random exercise, you get results that do make sense. And it's very easy for me to interpret them now because I'm a designer and I kind of know how they might be related. Uh, but when you're, when, when you're doing things like inuring and adjustments and things that you don't really understand, this is incredibly useful because you just don't have that common sense that users really um, uh, assume and this is your way to get into their language. Um, and all above that, even for uh, taxonomies that you feel aware of, um, I would strongly recommend doing this to get outside your own biases. So if you're doing an e-commerce for, say, toys or clothes, you might think you know how to group your experience. You might be like, oh, well, men's, women's, uh, babies. But users might think of them as like winter clothes, summer clothes, or like uh, fancy dress clothes and like work clothes. So you really have to, even for uh, taxonomies that you know, um, test how users think of them and this allows you to to get that insight from it so this is one of the useful um, outputs from the um, from the exercise just the triangles yes what would you consider to be a significant number like i see that 40 percent is on the heat map but is that i would <laughs> say about 50. 50 yeah i would kind of give that mark like if at least half of the users put them in the same group um, I would say 50 is my, my um, but then you do have, and it's very useful, like things like here, training, for example, stands out as not related to anything. And those are really good insights as well. You do have the odd one that's not grouped and that's not a bad outcome. It just means it's a, its own very different space. So un lack of relation is not necessarily bad as long as you understand why. So that's one way to do it. The other one is a dendrogram. So you get this kind of tree where, uh, let's see if this helps a little bit. Um, yes, so you kind of see how the different groups um, have been, so each of these trees is like a different grouping from a, from a user and then you can highlight them to see how they're related. So areas of design, that makes a lot of sense, isn't, doesn't it? Like user research, design research. So someone labeled these areas and uh, someone else uh, labeled it areas of design. And you can see within them, the areas of design are just this bit. So like you can start look, seeing some separation between them. Here, resources, trends and insight, future. So again, um, you see a, a different grouping similar to what we saw um, in the triangles. 
So the insights and the future trends being together. And then here, career, career progression. Um, so again, makes sense. And this other group that we noticed, so tools, like things like processes, best practices, methodologies, tools. So you can see different kind of um, uh, ways to group them. Um, and you can explore this to get your insight on what makes sense for the users. Um, the last one that I find really useful is here the, um, uh, this is the automatic grouping. So essentially you, you ask the software to make automatic groupings. Say you want to have just two groupings. So if I was to do an information architecture with just two groups, let's see, two to three groups, um, I, those would be my groups. So I would have one for um, the best practices, qualifications, one for the processes, and one for the kind of types of research. If I wanted to have three, uh, well, four, then you see that the, many, the career kind of stays again on its own. Um, and now sponsorship is on its own. So kind of the one thing that's um, missing is kind of on its own. So there's a lot of um, different ways this uh, software will, will help you visualize your results. Um, we don't have time to go through all of them um, in this session, but you start to understand how you explore different visualizations of the um, data uh, to get insight from it. And you can see how um, it does make sense. It's not gibberish. Um, it does produce valid results. So for us as designers, um, I think I would stand behind this categorization. It's something that makes sense. So it's very useful in, um, in, um, in taxonomies that you don't feel so confident to categorize on your own. Um, that's the tool you can use.